and the dichotomy. The National Assembly makes the law. The executive implements the law. Go ahead on your voyage of discovery on your wild goose chase in the process of making the law, the National Assembly. Ultimately, it gets to us and we implement it the way we deem fit. Once we understand this division, I think we'll be comfortable because the National Assembly will make the law. Implement it the way they deem fit? No, no, no. Yeah, Isn't it, that, I mean, aren't there punishments we, for, for we all, implementing we all the know, law? We all know, how especially it for, the, for the period that we have also been part of government. You know that the, gov the budget is never implemented 100%. But it's not the right thing to do, is well, it? Well, most of the time, in order to avoid the controversy, allow the National Assembly to do what they want to do. You have the power, constitutionally, under Section 5, to execute and maintain the Constitution. So let them give you the, the budget uh, or the Appropriation Act and you maintain that which is feasible and that which is not feasible. But for you to draw a line of reasonability or unreasonability, it's not likely to work out. You are trying to circumscribe the National Assembly in their lawmaking uh, functions and that obviously will breed a lot of division and that is what we're seeing. So let them do the act. So let us use an instance, a very practical instance, because what Nigerians want to see is development come to them. Uh, you know, they want to see that what a government promises will be achieved and, and that will include uh, perhaps promises from the lawmakers as well and promises from the executive arm of government. Now assuming that, you know, na the National Assembly or the executive arm of government has a figure of say, uh, just a manner of speaking, and that's not what's in the budget, say $35 per barrel, and then say National Assembly members believe that, well, considering that oil prices are around, uh, hovering around, um, uh, say, $45 per barrel, we increase it by $10, and maybe for some instance, or for some reason, it drops to 40 what would you say should be done in that sort of instance? That's where the, the, the executive will need to reason out of the box and then see how they can manage the economy and of course drive the budget to a very reasonable extent. All I'm trying to say is that in the implementation of the Appropriation Act, it is purely within the purview of the executive and they can drive it the best way they can. But to think that because of that insight or the fact that you think you have a better insight than the National Assembly members, mark you, from the number of the National Assembly, they are also representative of the people. They are even nearer to the people than any other person. And like I said, the power to make law is vested in them as a legislature, while the executive, execution and maintenance of the Constitution is vested on one person, the president. One person, president, not the executive, not the minister. Isn't he representing the executive in that instance? No, he is. But what I'm trying to say is that you have 300 and something people, and then how many senators who are supposed to be representing the people directly? They also have information from their people. They can determine the needs assessment of their places and what they want. They can also help. It's not something that is imagined that is only the executive can bring to the table. They also have information. They know their needs in their respective uh, uh, constituencies. So you don't expect them to fold their arms and refuse to inject the needs of their uh, constituencies in the in the process of uh, budget. Let me quickly slot this in. Now the minister here says that in my budget you will find things like motorized boreholes, primary health care centers. He says this is a violation of the constitution. It shouldn't be in the appropriation law of the government. If the judiciary decides that the National Assembly that should make the budget and well and hand over the book and hand it over to the executive to implement it, so be it. But he says he doesn't think that you can sit down and legislate projects that are not federal projects. That's projects that ideally state government should have, you know, perhaps states and local government should have a purview over, are now being found in a budget that's meant for the federal government. I, do I think that that should come up at all? And that's why I say you implement the budget. You implement it. If you think that it is unreasonable, you push it aside. That shouldn't be a, the basis for controversy as to who has the power to make law. They have the power to make the law, you have the power to implement. Instead of in highlighting something that you consider unreasonable, just push it aside and don't implement it. I believe that if we follow that road, I think there will be no controversy. Because the powers are very There well wouldn't shared. be? There shouldn't be. There shouldn't be. I don't think there should be. The only way there should be no discrepancy or problem or controversy, as the case may be, is to amend the Constitution. But if we are truly looking at the Constitution, I cannot interpret the Constitution because I'm not a judge. But I seriously wonder 
if there will be a departure from my own insight on this matter. Well, we'll take a break now and then we'll come back and get more insights into professors thinking on what precisely will happen if each of our governments is just exercising their powers without, you know, coming together. Oh, that will be it. That will be just a moment. Please stay with us. <laughs>